Hello, and welcome to What Comes to Mind, Season 2 of The Psychonaut Show. This is John K. Burton, MD, psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, and your host on this podcast that brings ideas from the history of psychoanalysis to solve problems in everyday life. In this episode, I'm very excited because we have a guest, a listener, who's thought about one of the episodes and the concept in that episode, and we thought that we could struggle with it, think about it together. And I'm really happy to have this person here because I actually have had a few people write in, shout out to Sean in Brooklyn and his fantastic example of projective identification, and John over in New Jersey and writing to me about the Oedipus complex, and I even had somebody from Sweden write to me. And that's really the best way to make use of the ideas that we have here. It's really the mission of the Psychonaut Show for us to have a conversation. And I think that's really where it comes alive. I hope that this kind of episode is something that we'll do more. And if anyone wants to call in and think with me together about a particular idea that you've heard about on the Psychonaut Show, please do. Because honestly, kids, I really get sick of listening to myself after a while, and it's a little lonely. So I'm really happy to have Kathleen here. Hello, Kathleen. Hi, Dr. John. Tell us what was the episode, what was the concept that you were thinking about today that you wanted to talk more together about and and sort of, you know, wrestle with in conversation? An episode that really resonated with me, it had to do with the eight stages of life. Uh Uh-huh. Which itself was a concept that I was only probably minimally aware of. So just as a reminder, that's the eight stages of life. Man by Eric Erickson, who we talked about in the uh, in the first season. The parts that that got to me, obviously, I'm in the adult stage of my life. I'm I'm over 21, far over 21. Uh, <laughs> and do you want to narrow that down at all? <laughs> <laughs> I choose not to. Okay. <laughs> what I thought was interesting was that every stage of life has a certain amount of meaning, and what I got from the episode, in part, was that you kind of need to, I don't know if master is the right word, each stage, but come to some sort of terms with each stage to go on to the next stage. And how you deal with this, with that stage what may influence or affect the next stage in, in, in some way. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Each stage has a task is the way that you can think of it that needs the theme of that stage of life that is front and center and needs to be accomplished. And how you accomplish it affects the subsequent tasks of each stage of life. I have have passed through most of the stages, past adolescence certainly, into probably stages chronologically seven and eight. But I think that where I've been stuck in my life was probably on stage six. Mm -hmm. From what I got out of of what was said in the podcast. And I I don't know. And I just want to say that I'm talking to Kathleen in person. If other people want to talk, we can call in and we can Skype. But Kathleen has copious notes written on the different stages, which I absolutely love because part of the Psychonaut show is is being a little wonky and nerdy and thinking about this stuff and trying to, you know, wrestle with it in that way. So I, I just love the fact that she's going through her notes as we're talking. Uh, thank you. <laughs> copious, but somewhat hard to read notes. Okay, but adolescence is stage five. And that the task there is fidelity to oneself, a self-identity and uh, consolidation. That actually might have been another one for as an aside, yeah. your role on an identity. Yeah, so season. adolescence absolutely is about identity. Um, and Erickson calls it fidelity, but it's having an identity that, that you are clear about with yourself mm-hmm. versus one that feels the failure of the task, quote unquote. When the task fails, it's identity disintegration. We don't really have a good sense of, of who we are. And then stage six, which is love, between intimacy and isolation where do i fit into society or as a worker what was the task associated with that one developing meaningful relationships unless it is developing meaningful relationships or i made that the task you know this is where i get confused as well Mm -hmm. the difference between stage six and stage seven is confusing and stage six is about love and stage seven is about care. Those are the words that he uses. 
The way that he goes on to describe it is stage six is about developing intimate relationships. Remember, Erickson is, he was writing in the 50s and 60s, and it was a time of reform and thinking about new things. And he's certainly adding new ideas to the psychoanalytic movement, but it was still in a somewhat traditional framework. And that around that time, you're thinking about getting married. And basically, that's the idea, that the task is to find an intimate relationship a partner in love, and to get married. Now, he doesn't get so specific, and he talks about other ways that we can find that kind of experience, whether it's in very important relationships in your friend group or that kind of thing. You know, it's not the adolescent friend group. It's sort of the friendships that come after that that are really the lasting friendships. So but that's kind of the theme of that stage of life, as in contrast to the next stage, which is about care and the word that gets used more is generativity. What am I going to create in the world? And again, from the sort of traditional psychoanalytic, like this is the healthy way to live life that's not neurotic, that in you know ultimately ended up being very sort of straight down the middle and kind of conservative. If you think about Mad Men and the image of psychoanalysis there, where Betty Draper had to go because you know she was having some kind of symptoms, and the psychoanalyst was there to make her a good wife and mother who was happy with her lot in life, then there's still some kind of overlay on that. And stage seven is basically about having children and like turning yourself over to the world. Like, what am I doing in the world or as a career? What do I do in the world to create, to generate? But it really is thinking about children. For the male and female perspective. For male and female, though, you know, differentiated. And then for people who don't have children, you know, Erickson doesn't go so far as to say if you don't have children, you, you're going to fail at stage seven. There are other ways of being generative, in, you know, in, in your community, in your career, that kind of thing. I, I hope that, you know, in acknowledging my confusion, too, about six and seven and sort of wrestling with what they are, that the difference, the tasks that six and the tasks that seven are really related to one another. What's confusing to me is that I feel like we're kind of doing both right. in our 20s and 30s and you know, 40s and beyond. But, you know, the tasks of the 20s and 30s include both, and it's sort of hard to say that one comes before the other. But that's the way his model goes. On intimacy versus isolation, I haven't, like, had an intimate, like, love, like, love affair type love. But definitely not one that's been lasting. That's I'm, I'm not in that space now. Uh, and I haven't had one in a while. So, like, does that make it... If you can't get... If you don't hit your marks, so to speak, in one area of life, according to Erickson, what does that mean in terms of your growth as a human being? Hmm. That's what I, I think about. Not to say that I haven't had a happy life, uh, but maybe it's not as full in the human spectrum or human mind as... as as the human mind expects it to be. Do you know what I mean? We're, we're obviously no longer in the age of Erickson, but it doesn't mean that some of the fundamentals that he was talking about were right, or on the point in terms of like the human psyche and satisfaction. See, this is what's so great about having listeners kind of reach out and have a conversation is I hadn't really thought about the implication of this, but you're really bringing that out, which is that this is a way of, thinking about how do I know my life has been lived fully and richly and what sort of deficits or lacks might I have that I need to think about. And I I really hadn't thought about Erickson's model in this way, but it certainly is about that. And and we're thinking like, should we be using it that way? To what extent should we think about any of these concepts in that way? Um, But as a point of clarification, to go back to the chronology point, one of the things that Erickson said is, that if there's a difficulty in one stage of life, it might be because of conflicts in the achievement of the task of an earlier stage of life. So if we're looking at, I never quite had an intimate relationship. I don't feel like I fully achieved the task of stage number six. It might not just be about stage number six. What he's sort of saying is, We want to look at what might have happened earlier in life that looks like it was achieved, but then has an effect later down the line. 
And this really gets to the importance of development from my point of view of thinking of people not as snapshots, like when you meet a person, that's who they are, but they're a person with a story and you're only seeing like one slice of the arc of their whole life. And this model kind of calls us to say, okay, there's this problem at this point in life. How might it be a manifestation of some things that have happened before? Okay. For example, if someone has a problem in their, you know, adolescent task of knowing what their identity is, it might be because they had a problem earlier in life in the um, second stage, the stage of autonomy versus dependence, where they weren't quite allowed to kind of, you know, and this is like the toddler period, like to be on their own, their individuality wasn't celebrated by their parents mm-hmm. as a young child. And that shows up later in life in their teenage years as an inability to really feel free to determine who they are in the world. That would be an example of one stage earlier affecting another stage. So I kind of bring this up to say, does anything come to mind about that when you think about the challenges of the stage six stage of love and intimacy? Not in terms of, like, I, I can't remember back to being, I was a toddler, really. So, <laughs> no, not not on that level, but maybe in terms of, like, a, the fidelity components of, of, like, maybe not adolescence, but early adulthood as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a lot of, I've, I've always, I guess, had what people might view as a successful career, mm-hmm. but I've had a lot of ambivalence in some ways about, like, my chosen career path, mm-hmm. which was probably influenced by um, adolescent fantasies about what it would mean to be a lawyer. Um, also, parental guidance around the same. I think there are other things that I preferred, but probably was I was afraid to like take the chance and try something else. Mm. So maybe in the, from that point of view, the fidelity component, but I don't remember in terms of one through four, but there are the other stages. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm talking about it from the model point of view, sort of intellectually, like no one can really go back to age three and yeah. say what was mm-hmm. going on. So, but adolescence, to your point, is something that we can often remember, even though many times there are things we don't want to remember, but adolescence, <laughs> it's a difficult time. And the thought that you have, I think, is really worth pursuing, which is I consolidate my identity, certainly professionally in adolescence, but not without some ambivalence and conflict, like welcome to the club, right? Mm -hmm. But maybe that has affected the ability to sort of achieve the task or meet the task. Let's let's put it not such in a deficit negative way. Let's say, you know, like it had some extra baggage, some extra material that needs to be resolved that you bring forward with you into the next stage of life and you have to resolve that as well. So I've had intimate relationships when I was younger. And I guess even I've had relationships throughout my life, uh, heterosexual, so with men is what I'm mm-hmm. talking about, of different qualities in terms of like, you know, how decent really mm-hmm. they were. Mm-hmm. But I guess what I mean is like, I haven't had what I would define as, I hate to use like cliches, but intimate or like an intimate meaningful intimate relationship in ages so and i think that i don't like to speak about things in terms of deficit but i think that's something that's missing uh, yeah i don't hear you talking about it as a deficit i hear you talking about it as something that you want i'm not entirely buying all of this as i think about some of what we're talking about like adolescence and the identity figuring out identity confusion there are plenty of people who have identity confusion or not sure that they like what they're doing or want to do what they're doing or are dedicated to it. If that's what identity confusion is, and they go on, they have meaningful relationships. That's a, it's like, I think I don't feel like they're different. Maybe they're not always connected. <laughs> when that isn't achieved, it's a more kind of fundamental confusion mm-hmm. about who one is an inability to kind of make basic decisions about Who do I want to be with? What do I want to do? Not, I like this about being a lawyer, but I would have liked this about being an actor. That's more out in the world. The fidelity to identity is is a more personal sense of confidence about who one is. That's a little bit harder to articulate. Okay. So what we were thinking of is uh, an example of somebody who seems like they have a good healthy, intimate relationship, but might have an identity 
diffusion. It's called identity diffusion or a disintegration problem where they don't have a strong sense of themselves. If you really talk to them, that person either looks like a really indecisive person and they have indecision about things in the world, but they know who they are. You have to be a person. You have to have a sense of I am I to show up and be in a relationship. If you can't do that, it's very hard to have a healthy, intimate, collaborative relationship. When you say, I had some ambivalence about my identity in adolescence, can you say more about that? I can, but I, I don't know if I'm on point. I was thinking more about my identity in terms of like what I would do. Sounds like one of the sort of societal messages that you got as an adolescent was your identity is largely centered around what you do for a living, what your career is. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's true. Yeah. That's societally, within my family to some extent as well, but that's something that I did adopt. You know, sort of as we're talking about what do these different phases really mean and what are the tasks, I think it's clear that that's actually a problem in terms of identity <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. consolidation and fidelity, that there's sort of an over-prioritization for you of career and what do you do. And that that's the, a lens through which you see yourself, which is not a bad lens or problematic, but it may be overly relied on in terms of identity. And then that would affect the ability to kind of show up in an intimate relationship, which is about more than, you know, that that's not the point of an intimate relationship right. or about love is what, what do you do for a living kind of thing. It's about kind of being able to be yourself in connection with someone else who is their self. Maybe. I mean, I, I'm not, I would think what I hear, for example, is being able to be vulnerable. Mm. And um, you need to do that if you want mm -hmm. to be in a relationship with somebody, with someone. Mm -hmm. And I probably, that doesn't come readily. Although I feel like I can, I'm honest, but I guess that's not the same thing as vulnerable. And well, I, what do you mean when you say vulnerable? I think I, I mean being able to share the most mundane but also the most intimate details of one's of your thoughts maybe being able to openly give maybe without expecting anything back it could be um being able to talk about when you're not sure about things insecurities i'll say right now you you're you are allowing yourself to be vulnerable with me yeah which some, sometimes things happen in the moment, and right. it's a, they're they're also examples of what we're talking about. That's information. So that's what, that's what I mean. I think that I, I I referred to being able to be honest. I think that I can be vulnerable. I think though that I I present in such a way that maybe people feel like they're not going to those things are not available, like vulnerability and and uh, compassion, etc. You so, mean available to, to them. That they, that they won't get that from, from me. Oh. Um, so that, that that can be some, that, that can be a barrier. I presented like, uh, like I want to say not the word like brick wall, but like there was something hard to, unapproachable. Mm. And not like because I was such a beautiful woman or something like that, mm. but like unapproachable um, and, and intimidating in some mm. ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and what did you make of? Well, I, I asked the type of ways, why is that, mm -hmm. did I come off that way? The guy had a hard time explaining it. It was just a vibe. Maybe of not being very good at flirting, maybe. You know, like I think men need signs that women are interested in them. So if you don't give off those signs, just like by you know, smiling or, or whatever else, I think you come off as unapproachable. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for like bringing up a story because it's a specific <laughs> example. And one thing that I, I always tell people is important is that we understand like the larger issues that we're trying to understand by looking at the little details, the little stories, the little ways that they show up that seem random to us, or it was just this one time, or it 
it was 20 years ago or whatever. But when we tell a story and we think about it, it tells us something about what we're trying to understand now. And I think that you thought of that story because it's relevant to what you're talking about now. Now, of course, you're not the same person. It's not the same issues, but you're telling it because there's some kernel of how you saw yourself reflected that feels relevant to the right. now that you ironically it sounds like the other person felt like they couldn't be vulnerable because of what they perceived from you whereas you felt like i don't know it could just be different from a lot of other people just period i think sometimes some people are different in terms of like what their how they come off to people what their needs are and that's not to say that i don't need love and intimacy and things like that because i have i have those things but it i could just be operating well i certainly hope that there's a place for people to operate differently. Yeah, well, come on. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, that's that's part of that's a big part of what the mission of this podcast is about is to open up exploration of our inner worlds, which is different. We each have an inner world that's our own, and by being able to acknowledge them, we we have to get along in the outside world, which we all share. But to feel like our inner world is, you know, special and it's worthwhile. This is testament number three, the birthright of goodness. We're all good and we're all in your own way. There should be a place for that. You've had a hard time finding that, mm -hmm. but you should be able to um, have what you want in life by being who you are. Being who you are does, of course, sometimes make more difficulties for some people. But quite frankly, I feel like people who fit in really well with conventions and being what sort of society likes ha have their own problems. That, that's just my vantage point as a, as a psychoanalyst. They may have their own problems, but they probably go through the eight stages of life, maybe. <laughs> that's a really interesting question. It might look like that from the outside, but how things look and how the person experiences them, what's going on in their inner world, it can be very different. And unless you're actually talking to them and, Kind of wrestling with it as we are you really don't know well of course this brings up a, a value and that value is on what's one's inner experiences what the individual experience is which is not a value that everyone shares you know some societies or cultures or groups whatever think fitting in with the the group and doing what the group thinks is is the right thing to do um, i don't think those things have to be opposed to one another but certainly there's a value on what's going on in your inner world, and that takes a priority. That's right. a priority. I've never thought about fitting with the group, actually. See, I think, you know, that... You again, that's the problem. That from, my, <laughs> from my experience, that looks like there's a problem, but what that is is a gift, and it makes you think about things, it makes you reflect, it makes you consider your humanity. In fact, I would argue that you're saying... I am different and I don't do things like other women do is actually the necessary ingredient for being in a truly generous, beautiful, intimate love relationship. That's what makes it special. Not because you've been in. Oh, that's interesting. It does make it makes sense in some ways if it was if I could put it into practice. Yeah. And this, I think, might be, you know, going back to the point that you pulled out about the model of the eight stages of man, that it serves as a kind of a roadmap or a, a, an idea of what a well-lived life is, that there is a dark side to that, to kind of match yourself against it and say, oh, I don't have this, so I must have not achieved the task. And that's not the point of, I mean, I don't have Eric Erickson here to like comment on this, <laughs> but in terms of how I think about it, how I use it, why I brought it into the podcast as something to talk about, it's not to have this external map of what tasks you need to achieve in your life, but to kind of think about if I'm struggling in this area, how can I think about that and how can I wrestle with it? And I feel like some of what you're bringing up relates to another concept um, from Winnicott, who we've talked about previously in the transitional space episode. But a, a concept that it, it's making me think of, of his, that we'll talk about in a future episode, is the concept of the true self and the false self. 
And mm-hmm. just briefly, I'll give a little teaser on that. The true self is, is sort of Winnicott's somewhat philosophical, but it's like just who we are meant to be. Again, like I put it in Testament number three, our birthright. Like we're meant to be an authentic, again, without being cliched, because the word authentic gets used all over the time in social media and blog posts and everything. But it's still a good word. Like when you feel like you're you're being genuine, you're not being affected or constructed, you feel in the flow. That's your true self. And then there's the false self. And it is what we create for the benefit of those around us, for the benefit of society as represented by our parents. What do our parents, what does society want from us? And I give that to them. It's conformist, the false self. And what's interesting about the false self is it's there to protect the true self. And this, I think, gets to your thought about vulnerability. Vulnerability means I show you my true self. I'm not giving you my false self. And a little bit of what I hear when you talk about sort of the task of identity consolidation, stage number five, Mm -hmm. there's a little bit of a sense of the false self coming in. And it's not that being a lawyer is false or that messages that your parents told you about the importance of career and everything is false, but it you have to look at what is the purpose of it. Does it feel like it's something that's genuine from within or is it something that you give to other people because it's what they expect of you? Now, of course, those two things don't have to be opposed to one another. And we might say that psychological health comes from from integrating those two things into a cohesive sense of ourselves, being able to be present to other people and consider what they want from us and to be able to interact but not have it be as a liability for who we are. And again, it seems like in terms of that identity question, there's just kind of a weight on that side of what do other people want of me and expect of me? I'm a conscientious, responsible, successful, intellectual, you know, in your case, attorney, useful person in the world. And that's really an important part of yourself and and it's authentic again there may be a way that it's kind of weighted itself and other aspects of identity that are more intimate have not been celebrated by Uh society Uh as much that it made you wary as is understandable about sharing them with others But again, in terms of having a relationship, an intimate relationship that's worth having, you don't want to start with like, why don't I have a relationship and how can I be someone that can be in a relationship? It's going back to that identity question and saying, what's my true self? And being more comfortable and more confident that that's what's going to lead you to the love stage that Erickson was talking about. That's helpful, but it's also in some ways uh, distressing. So I, <laughs> so I both don't know my true self or I'm not letting my true self come through and also lack of an ability to be intimate in some ways. So I don't even know myself completely. Yeah. I'm cutting myself off from myself. Are, are you saying that in a way like I'm telling you these things? That's or? what it sounds like you're saying in some ways. I don't want to give you that... M- Message. message in such a like dire way that you seem to be feeling it but can you just tell me what you think of those ideas I think I do think that um, I, I agree that, that I probably wear a mask to some extent or like maybe that's the false self the self that I present to the world just because that's part of what you do when you get up it is morning. it absolutely is you know the False self sounds like this terrible thing, particularly in modern times where we're all supposed to be authentic and vulnerable and blah, 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 to the point where it's inauthentic and, you know, false to be saying this stuff all the time. The false self is constructed as a gift. It's there to protect the true self. It's there to protect the true self. And we need to respect it in that way. We need to not judge it and, and say this is a terrible thing. We need to respect it and honor it in order to put it in its place so that the true self can kind of live in harmony with it It, and say maybe to the false self, you don't need to work so hard to protect the true self. You can work together. 
I, I can totally understand why it would sound like um, I'm saying, you know, you don't know your true self sort of thing. But the message that I want to give is not like you, your your true self has been smothered or something like mm-hmm. that, but that the false self has been working so hard to protect it and that this is an opportunity to kind of reevaluate that relationship and whether it needs to work so hard. But it, but it exists for a reason and, mm-hmm. and we have to respect it. And, and, and quite frankly, I, th- I think we need to be grateful for it too. Actually, that's kind of a message of love in some ways and in intimacy. The, yeah. the true self is also. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a mo- it's absolutely a model of, of a relationship that could be conflictual, but really doesn't need to be. It's really one that is um, loving and collaborative. Yeah. Also, just for the purposes of our intellectual discussion and you, I sort of brought in this other concept of the true self and the false self, which I hope is helpful and also mm-hmm. is in the service of just saying what comes to mind and right. wandering around the intellectual landscape and thinking about stuff. But um, you came in wanting to think about the eight stages of man and this sort of thing. And I feel like I I want to make that link to like thinking about identity and mm. who am may, maybe giving more nourishment to the parts of yourself that are not the, this is who I am in society, but the other parts of one's identity might be something that was an unfinished task unfinished of business. Ad- unfinished business of mm-hmm. that stage five of identity consolidation and adolescence that might be helpful in terms of your journey in stage six of love and intimacy. And I just wonder what you think of that idea. It, on some levels, it does make sense. How do you, if you don't, if I don't separate the two that much. And maybe that, that I think that part of, that might be part of the issue. Like I do recognize that there is a persona in some ways in public space. And that I also have my, my own side of myself that I share more with like friends and family, mm-hmm. but it's not a, a clean divide. Sometimes both the other sneaks into the mm-hmm. true self, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even in, in intimate relationships. So maybe that is like that, that, that could be part of it. I don't know how to, that I necessarily know how to turn that off, though. So we're sort of coming to a point that I come to with people a lot of the time because today people are are not submissive psychoanalytic patients like they used to be in the 50s (laughs) where the analyst was not required to, like, come up with what do I do with what, you know, the the question of what do I do with this? Uh And I feel like on the one hand, psychoanalysis allows us to not have to know what to do about it. But on the other hand, I don't think we should, as analysts, let ourselves off the hook and just sort of say, you know, that's not my job kind of thing that we should really be wrestling and struggling with it too. Not promising like, this is the action plan, but say, yeah, let, let's think about what to do. And I don't think, as in many cases, the answer isn't clear, but I hope that we've kind of like shown a light down the path of what might be something to observe more about how you move through the world of love and intimacy. These parts of yourself that it sounds like you're very much in touch with in other areas of your life that actually, as we think about it, really need to be at the table when when you're in the arena of love and intimacy and they may have been sort of taking a back seat in terms of your consciousness. So what is the lesson here? It's this, that conversation about ideas leads to new understandings about those ideas. No matter how much experience we have or education we have or how much we've thought about an idea, when we talk about it together, new understandings come out. And that's the case in the conversation with Kathleen. Kathleen brought up the idea that the eight stages of man is a model for how to live a good life. Whether you agree with that model or not, we can think of it as as Erickson offering a template for how to think about how we're living our lives. And I had never thought about Erickson's model in that way. Another thing that came out of the conversation is that adult development can be hard to define, even as we realize it is so important. And lastly, my conversation with Kathleen showed again how the relationship between different parts of ourselves can be models of love and intimacy. 
This is Dr. JKB signing off. Since we are exploring together, you make the journey all the richer by subscribing to the show on iTunes. And even better, if you also leave a rating, it helps others to find us. If you have a story about how the concept in this episode helped you figure out something in your life, send it in, please. You can also find me on Facebook and Twitter at Psychonaut Show. Show notes are on the website, thepsychonautshow.com. And if you leave me a question, it may well be an inspiration for an upcoming episode. Until our next trip, judge nothing, question everything. And remember, there's always a reason. Bye for now. All the patient stories presented on The Psychonaut Show are created by me to illustrate an idea. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. The Psychonaut Show was created and produced by yours truly, John Burton. Art and web design by Hunter Creative. Post-production and sound design by Julio Gonzalez of Zimmer Media. Zimmer Media can be found online at zimmer.co. That's X-I-M-E-R dot C-O. 